Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we come to you this morning just asking that you would work in our hearts and our minds, Lord, as we open up your word. Lord, that we truly would see that Jesus is better. God, help us to understand your instruction. Give us understanding. Lead us in the path of of your truths, Lord. Help us to delight in it. Help us to incline our hearts to you, Lord, to turn our eyes from looking at worthless things, to see you for who you are in all your beauty. God, help us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Amos chapter 7 this morning. Amos chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there's probably a blue one uh, underneath maybe the seat around you, in front of you. Uh, You could grab one there, or uh, it'll also be on the screen this morning. And so Amos uh, chapter 7, we uh, originally were going to be looking at the whole chapter, Uh, but unfortunately... Uh, it's hard to get through some, uh, some of this text without stopping and pausing and just going slowly. And so we are in no hurry, and uh, we want to hear from the Lord and what He has to say through His Word. And so this morning we uh, will be looking at verses uh, 1 through uh, 6 this morning. If someone listened in on your prayers over the last week, what would they have heard? I know you want me to rush to the next thing, but if someone would have been listening to your prayers this past week, honestly, what would they have heard? Would they have heard a prayer for your own faithfulness? A prayer of zeal for God's glory in the church? Would they hear a a concern for those who live in your house, your your spouse, your kids? Would they hear a a prayer of of compassion for those in need? Would they hear your pleas for God's mercy and for God's forgiveness? Would they hear a surrender or even a a willingness to make more of Jesus than than your own self, your own career, your, your own ambition? Would they have heard the the prayers of of your faithfulness for your neighbors and for for their salvation? Would they hear you praying for for more laborers to come into the harvest? If someone was listening in on your prayers of the last week, really, what would they have heard? Throughout the book of Amos, we we have observed time and time again a man named Amos, an ordinary sheep herder, a fig farmer turned prophet who was burdened for God's people. Burdened so much so that he set aside sheep herding, he he set aside being a fig farmer to go and to declare the the gospel to to a people that didn't want to listen to it. He was burdened. You can't help in reading Amos to see and hear his concern and his compassion and his sympathy for the people of God. In fact, if we were listening in, we would hear and see that he is overcome with this desire to see God's people repent and to turn from themselves and to turn from their their way to the one and only God. In fact, you will see this morning that Amos was so driven by concern and compassion and sympathy for the people that it moves him to intercede, to beg God for for mercy for a people that did not deserve it. But his heart is burdened. I want us to see that together this morning. And so if you would stand out of reverence and respect for God's word, we're going to read Amos 7 verses 1 through 6. And I pray that this passage would drive us to intercede for others, to be faithful in it, that it it wouldn't just be an afterthought in, in our lives, but it would be something that consumes us the way that it consumed Amos. May God help me. May God help you 
to be submissive and to surrender in that way to him. May we grow and mature and may we find great joy in what the Lord has for us even this morning. And so in Amos 7, beginning in verse 1, this is the reading of the word. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord God, please forgive How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, O Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. May God bless you in his word. You may be seated this morning. In verse 1, this is what the Lord showed Amos in a vision. He showed Amos what was coming. God is the author who causes Amos to, to see something that will devastate the land. Amos thus sees God forming a huge swarm of of locusts that can devour every green plant. God is is forming it. He is is creating it, right? He's put it into existence, this swarm of locusts that were going to to take out the crop. Now, the timing of this plague is is critical for for really two reasons. The the locusts are being formed after the king's share of the crop has been harvested. Uh, This is probably harvest because of uh, really probably grass for uh, the king's horses. So so the king would get like a a tax of of what people were growing to to feed his his animals. And that had already taken place. And so his animals were well fed. But now if this locusts come, what would happen is is that this young tender spring crop uh, that is sprouting would be destroyed and the peasant part farmers would be affected and so it suggests that the royal needs have been met but the the average peasant farmer will be in serious trouble if the locusts had come weeks earlier that there would not yet be any sprouting grain and thus no harm to israel's farmers if it had come later the crops would set back by the locusts but but not totally destroyed and so because of the timing of of the locusts coming this this heightens amos's compassion for the poor farmers He knows that it's going to affect the poor of the poor. He he knows it's going to affect the lowly of the lowly. And so what will be left? It'll be a considerable hopeless situation that they would find themselves in. In verse 2, notice in Amos' vision, if God doesn't stay his judgment, the locusts will finish eating the grass of the land and everyone will then starve to death. This affects Amos. He's distraught. We, we got to pause there. I mean, as we, we think about the, the people around us and the sins of the people around us, and we think about our own sin, and we, we think how it destroys, and we think how, how it breaks down. Are we distraught over the sins of the people that are around us? Are, are we humbled and distraught and, and lowly by, by our own sin? By the effects of our own actions? He is completely distraught, and his compassion for the people rises to the forefront. Amos begins to pray with compassion. He he begins to pray that God would have mercy. Much like Moses at the golden calf, Amos relies on the the long-suffering, the the patient, and the, the forgiving nature of God. Exodus 34, 6, we're not going to turn there, we're not going to read it, but a reference to it. But unlike Moses, there is no reasoning with God about the impression this will have on Israel's neighbors or or any appeal to some promise to the forefathers. Amos' prayer is a lament. A a lament, we've talked about it often, asks how long and and why is this happening? We see see laments in Psalm 13 and Psalm 42 and, and Psalm 79. 
And so his prayer is a lament which is full of deep sympathy for the poor farmers who will suffer the most misery. I mean, the poor of the poor have already suffered. The the rich have crushed them. They are laying on their ivory beds. They are drinking wine from huge bowls. I mean, they have the life of the life. They've even abused their servants, even sexually. These people have been crushed time and time again. And Amos knows if the locusts come as discipline from the Lord, that it will wipe out the poor of the poor, the people in need. They've already suffered uh, under the oppression of the wealthy landowners. Why will God make them the object of his anger? And so Amos is boldly calling for God's forgiveness. And though forgiveness is usually based on previous response of of repentance, but that's not the case this time. When, When sin is confessed, God no longer holds the sinner accountable, and the punishment is removed. But since there is no sign of any repentance by by Israel, Amos is asking for an act of pure grace that was undeserved. He requests God's compassion because some in Israel will not be able to survive. They are just too small, as he says on two occasions. They they are just too uh, insufficient. They're, They're too insignificant. These were the little people, like the orphan, like the widow, with whom God is especially concerned all throughout Scripture. Jeroboam's army is strong and his horses have plenty of hay, but the poor people will have nothing without God's mercy. But look there in verse verse 3. We see God's response. In verse 3, we see God's response, which is somewhat uh, immediate and also somewhat surprising. The plague is actually stopped before it begins and without any prerequisites god does not make his decision to stop the locusts if the people first do this or that a condition that honestly would would make sense to us right but he doesn't do it with any prerequisites it's an act of pure grace it's an act of pure mercy on a people who have rebelled against him for centuries. God's relenting uh, on his plans is a way of explaining really his personal interaction with the prophet and his people, that that he is compassion, that he is long-suffering, that he is patient. God is compassionate for the people. It's not inconsistent with God's character. We, We know ourselves and we know how God is patient with us. We know God's character. And God does not change. But we see that his mercy reveals the depth of his patience and and his openness to hearing the prayers of of righteous intercessors. He hears Amos' prayer. God is not some mindless abstract principle of philosophy who rules by some set of uh, mechanical computer formulas. God is personal. God is a caring ruler who does not enjoy the punishment of the wicked. In Ezekiel 18.23, it says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? God stops the locusts because he is merciful. God holds him back because he is compassionate. God richly pours out his love to those who do not deserve it. The removal of the locust plague postpones God's wrath for another day. Now in verses 4 through 6, we come to the the second vision, and and you'll see its structure really is parallel to to the first vision. What does he show show him? In in verse 5, or sorry, in verse 4, he shows Amos a, a great fire. Notice it with me. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. And it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. And so in this second vision, we see this this great fire that can destroy the sea and the land. It is a a ferocious and it is a a powerful fire that can devour both matter and the water in the depths of the ocean. It really is, is a divine fire. It's enormous in size. 
Deuteronomy 32, 22 also refers to a fire that burns to the lowest parts of Sheol, that, that consumes the earth, that, that sets on the fire the foundations of the mountains. And so I don't know exactly what kind of fire it is. It, it could be some kind of huge volcanic eruption. It could be a burning star that hits the earth. I mean, who knows how God could do it. He could do it in any way that he wanted. But it is a fire that consumes everything. And so whatever the source of this fire, Amos, he again intercedes with a prayer for God to stop the fire. Notice what, what he says there. Oh, Lord God, please cease. Remember, Amos is at the mercy of God. He knows that God is the authority, that he's the sovereign God that is in control of all things. And Amos knows that he's a God that is compassionate. And so Amos is interceding on behalf of a sinful people. Amos again laments the fate of the nation. But unlike the first vision, there is no request for forgiveness in the second one. The basis for this request is really the same as the, the earlier rationale. Israel is so small and, and it cannot last under, under great judgment. God's response is the same as his earlier decision. He stops the fire, for, for no one can survive the onslaught of his wrath. More time is provided for the Israelites to respond before his judgment. Remember that our sovereign God is long-suffering and surprisingly patient. His grace extends to undeserving people again and again. Many times people ask if God is sovereign and in control of all things, then why pray? What difference would it really make? God's set it in motion. And this is really the wrong question to be asking. If God isn't sovereign, why would you pray? If God isn't in control, why would you pray? If he's not in control, he can't change anything. He can't do anything. But because God is in control, because God is sovereign over all things, God can relent. God does relent. God does show his compassion to undeserving sinners. God does give us mercy and kindness. Man, there's been so many times in my life I don't deserve any kind of grace from God. But he gives it anyway. That God is kind to you and to me. It was Luther who said this uh, about prayer. Prayer is not the overcoming of God's reluctance. It is the laying hold of God's willingness. That it's not as if God is reluctant to help. It's not as, as if God is reluctant to save. Luther said, let's pray and, and let's grab a hold. Let's cling to God's willingness to transform and to change. Amos is clinging to God's willingness. You know, God has an order and a way, but he also uses secondary means like, like Amos to intercede on behalf of the sinful and broken people. Think for a moment. Why did God give Amos a vision of what might happen? I mean, he knows Amos. He knows how, how he's been faithful to declare his word to, to a people that are fickle. As the wind blows, so are those people. Back and forth as the weather changes in Ohio, so are those people. I mean, they were double-minded in all their ways. But yet, Amos is there and he's faithful. He's faithful to walk out what God had for him. And so because he sees this vision, because he sees the discipline of the Lord through the locusts, because he sees that wrath, he sees through what is coming and he sees God. And he begs God to stop. He begs God to forgive. He gives Amos a, a vision and what does Amos do? He intercedes. He begins to pray. He begins to plead for, for God's mercy. He's pleading for God to, to stay his judgment and stay his wrath. And this passage is really significant because it actually teaches a lot of things. And really, as, I, as I've really thought about these just six verses, honestly, I was trying to go for all 17. And I'm like, what am I trying to do? But I really think that we could spend, in just the first six verses, we could probably spend at least two weeks on, on this because we're not going to cover everything. But I, I just want you to see a couple things from this passage and, and really just a couple reminders of who our God is. 
And so number one, number one, as believers, we have a Savior King who intercedes for us. I really believe that Amos truly knew God's love for him. He respected his sovereign God. He bowed down before him. He gave him his life to do whatever God wanted him to do. I mean, that, he, he had no plans to be a prophet. He surrendered to God's direction. He walked with the Lord through all of this. And I believe there's a close relationship there. There is a respect, there is an awe, there is a, a reverence that God's way was right and he was going to lead other people to do it as well. I want us to, to be reminded this morning as believers in Christ, we are the church gathered coming to sit before our king. And I want us to remember that even as we sit here, as I stand here, Jesus is interceding. He is praying on our behalf right now. He is going to the Father for you and for me. That is something that many times we lose sight of. If you're a follower of Jesus, he is interceding for you right now. When, when was the last time that you really paused to consider that? Dane Ortland in, in a great book, um, gentle and lowly, which we have a uh, hundred plus copies that are coming that, that are free. Uh, whenever we get them, they'll be free to you. Whoever the first hundred, they'll be stacked here. You can get a copy. But, but within it, Dane Ortland uh, says that the doctrine of the intercession of Christ is one of the most neglected doctrines uh, of all, right? It's one of the most neglected doctrines of, of all. And I, I believe he's right. He helps us consider and think about what, what it looks like that, that Christ is interceding. And, and I hope you'll, you'll pick up that book when we get it. We might have some in the bookstall. But, but think about it for just a moment. The, the risen Christ, the, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, is pleading to the Father on your behalf. In fact, Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Not only that, but, but he is pleading on the basis of his own person and work. I mean, there's nothing good in us that we can plead to the Father on our own behalf. It is Christ pleading to the Father on his behalf, on the work that he has done, on his atonement for our sins. That we are covered under the blood of Christ. In Romans 8.34, Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is in interceding, for us. Ortland says, he says this, he says, his interceding for us reflects his heart for us. Jesus interceding for you reflects his heart for you. The same heart that, that carried him through life and down into to the death on behalf of his people is the heart that now manifests itself in, in constant pleading with and, and reminding and prevailing upon his Father to always welcome us. That you and I, as we sit here this morning, that we are welcome before the Father. That Christ's heart is continually for you. That Christ is continually going to the Father on your behalf. It's a great reminder. If we are united by faith to him, his ongoing life at the right hand of the Father is a form of intercession for, for you and for me. If you are a believer, Jesus is, is praying for you right now. He, he is embracing you and he is bringing you before the Father. Be encouraged. Jesus never lets go. He is for you. He knows you. But this leads us to a second thing that we see within this passage. And specifically from Amos, right? The first one is really just about us and our relationship with Christ, right? And what he's doing for you and I. But secondly, as believers, we are called to intercede for others. I mean, everyone sees what, what Amos is, is doing. In the, in the midst of this dynamic interaction, Amos sets an example to all believers with his intercession for, the, for those whom God plans to judge. What is intercession? It, it involves mediation for the sake of someone else to, to alleviate a conflict between two parties. 
Okay, it, it would be like you interceding for one of your coworkers, going to, to the boss, interceding on that coworker's behalf. It'd be like you going to, to your school teacher, right? There's some school teachers in here, and interceding on your child's behalf. It would, you understand what I'm saying? It is a third party. A- Amos is not the one being judged. He is the messenger. But he is pleading on behalf of a broken people before a sovereign God. Who cares? Well, why intercede? Why should you and I intercede? Because God hears a person's prayers on behalf of others. Hezekiah interceded for for deliverance of his nation from the destructive hand of the Syrian king. The the Psalms uh, frequently have such requests. Psalm 143, verse 1. Hear my prayer, Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. The prophet Isaiah reminded uh, reminded his audience that God's ear is is not dull uh, of hearing. He says in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God hears. God hears the, the prayers of, of a righteous person. A person that's praying on behalf of someone else. That prayer is a conversation with a God who hears our words and and he knows our thoughts. Why intercede? Because God hears a person's prayer on behalf of others. But secondly, because those who intercede care deeply about the ones for whom they are praying. Just get the picture of the text. Amos prays for God to stop the locusts because the poor farmers will not be able to survive these tragic events. We see that in verse 2. It was Moses that cared so much for for the Israelites who sinned by worshiping the golden calf that he pleaded with God to to blot him out of the book that that he has written, right? He says, blot me out, but save the people. He's interceding on behalf of someone else. The prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, interceded with words like the following in Jeremiah 8, 21 through uh, chapter 9, verse 1. For the wound of the daughter of my people is, is my heart wounded. Jeremiah is saying, because my people are crushed, I, I am crushed. He says, I mourn and, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm of Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jesus also sets the example of interceding with his care for little children in Matthew 19. His love for his disciples and concern for their unity after he would leave them in, in John 17. Paul cares for for his new churches. It's evident in his intercessory prayers for the enlightenment of believers in Ephesians 1. He's praying for for strength and and good theological roots in in chapter 3, verse 16 through through 17 of Ephesians. He's praying for the knowledge of of God's will and spiritual wisdom in Colossians 1. He's praying for a worthy walk, that they would be worthy of the word and worthy of, of the glory of God in 2 Thessalonians 1. Paul exhorts the the church at Ephesus to be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints in Ephesians 6. James, he encourages people to intercede for for healing of others, that God might heal. He says in James 5, 13 through 18, pray for the sick. Ask the elders to pray. Again, we see time and time again where God has called us to intercession. He's called us, the priesthood of believers, To pray on behalf of others. To go to God for others. Now, what are we to conclude about people who do not intercede for others? It's kind of hard to make generalizations, but just for a moment, there is busyness, there are other priorities. Maybe we have really just a a negative view of of life itself, a a low view of God's ability to transform a a situation. Maybe we have a a lack of compassion that that keeps us as believers from interceding on behalf of others. If you and I don't care about what happens to others, then we will not make the time to intercede for others. If you and I don't care for others, we will not make time to pray for others. 
If we as a people are only focused on our own desires, we will spend little time praying for the needs of others. If Abraham interceded for the few righteous people in the ungodly cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, if, if Moses interceded for the, the sinful Israelites who worshipped the golden calf just a few days after they had seen the glory of God on top of Mount Sinai, if Amos interceded for the pagan Israelites who worshipped the, uh, for the wicked people of Israel after the rebellion against him, if, if Jesus interceded for the Roman soldiers crucifying him, if Paul repeatedly interceded for the Jewish people who, who were not saved in Rome, Romans 9, it seems only reasonable to conclude that God expects believers to intercede for his mercy on behalf of sinful, wicked people. When the church does not pray, when the church does not ask, it is legitimate to wonder whether God will respond in compassion. When, when the church does not have time or energy to intercede, it, it is a legitimate wonder uh, if people will still care for others. When the church does not come to, to God for answers to problems, it, it is a legitimate wonder if, if his people still think that, that this God is interested enough or, or powerful enough to respond with life-transforming grace. Practical question that has to be asked, I think, from this passage is, when was the last time that, that I followed the examples in Scripture by deeply interceding for, for undeserving sinners in this world? When was the last time that I was truly committed to praying for the people in this body of believers? When was the last time that I was really committed walking through the week diligently, day after day, praying for the people that are in my life, praying for the neighborhood, praying for my coworkers, praying for the people around me. When was the last time? I mean, if someone was listening in on your prayers, what would they have heard this past week? I don't, I don't say that to guilt us. I mean, if, if you feel guilty in that, that is a conviction of God, and, and praise be to God, may, may it change the pattern of our life. But I just want to say that I think it just shows what we are really concerned about in this life. We love this world. We love the comfort. We love the things. It's all going to rust. It's all going to fade away. It's all going to break down. You're going to run through an intersection. It's going to get smashed. It's just stuff. What matters is people. People that God made in his image. Image bearers. And us investing and, and sharing the truth, no matter how difficult that might be. Praying that God would soften the hearts the hard-heartedness, my own hard-heartedness, my own callousness to sin. May God soften us. I mean, it's so easy, like, yeah, I can see everyone else. They're all messed up out there. No, you're sitting here, and you're messed up, and I'm standing here, and I'm messed up. And Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the better Amos who interceded on our behalf. He was the Lamb. That was slain. He was the final, ultimate sacrifice for you and I. Jesus is better. In 1 Timothy 2 1, this is what Paul says to Timothy. First of all, then I urge that supplications and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people. I think that's significant. You know, as a church, before COVID happened, we would have Sunday nights at 5, and we would, we would have a time, extended time, of prayer. Honestly, I, I get it. Like, um, it's interesting. I, I, think, I think we're seeing something in culture that's also true in the church, and I saw this uh, a couple years ago when we changed the schedule around. Um, you know, people get used to doing something, and they don't want to change and do something else. Uh, people in our culture right now have, have gotten used to maybe not working. Everywhere you go, there's, there's, there's uh, jobs, right? I think there's over 500 plus jobs at least in Dark County alone. 
uh, where you can make anywhere from $17 an hour to $30 an hour, and they can't find people to fill it. Why is that? Well, for a long extended period, uh, people weren't able to work, and so it, they got comfortable not working. It's the same way with the church. A church could once have a Sunday school, and the church could once have a Sunday night, and, and everyone was coming, but we changed that and alter it just a little bit if we try to bring it back. You know how many people usually came to the prayer meeting? Oh, about 15 people, about 20 people. Let me just ask, I mean, and again, how significant is it that we go to God in prayer? So let me close by encouraging you to pray more specifically in a couple of ways. Actually, there's a lot of ways. I'm going to rattle them off. You're not going to get them all. That's the point. There's just so many ways that we can pray. And, and my focus really, just like Amos's focus, would be to pray for those that are far from, from God. We, we are good at praying about a lot of other things. Um, and, and I'm not trying to undermine those other things. I, I really am not. And I want to be careful. But you know what? I, I've prayed more selfish prayers in my life for my own self than I have for the lost. And that's a problem. You know what? If I was to die right now in this moment, I would be with the Lord. You know, it would be gain for me and it would be loss for others, right? I, I know that I'm secure in Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. There are a lot of people in our lives that we can think of. And, they, and I just pray that names in your own life would come to mind that, that need Christ. If they were to die in this moment, they would be apart from, from God forever. May we be burdened to take the lost people to the Lord. May we be burdened to pray. May we be burdened to, to ask God for gospel conversations, to, to be able to start those kind of conversations with the people that are around us. So here's a couple things, okay? Here you go. Pray that God would relent of his wrath and show his mercy by saving people who are unreached right now. That There are people that are unreached around us right now. Pray, pray that God will relent of his wrath and, and show mercy to them and, and pray that God would send labors to them. Pray that God would send someone to, to cross their path. Again, I'm going to say a lot of things. You're not going to get it all. It's okay. Pray that God would send you as a laborer across someone else's path. Pray that missionaries that are out there in the world today that are in unreached areas would have confidence in God's word. Pray that as missionaries are getting up today to proclaim God's word, pray for them. Pray, pray for Trevin and Abby. Pray, put it on your list uh, as a weekly prayer request to, before the Lord. God, work. Open up the door for the gospel in northern Africa. A place where 99.9999999% don't know you. God, please, may the word, a door for the word be opened up in that place. May we see many come to know you there, of that tribe. May they surrender to you. Pray that, that believers would have power from God's spirit. Pray that, that believers would, would have victory in spiritual warfare. Pray that we as believers would be a gospel witness, that we would walk worthy of the word and worthy of the God who has called us. Pray that we as believers would have peace with other believers. Pray that we would have God's favor with our community, with your neighborhood, with your co-workers. God can change all of those things. Pray that we would know the word of God and clearly articulate it to the people that are around us. Pray for persecutors to see and come to know Christ through the lives of those they are persecuting and for justice. The locust coming, the fire coming, that God would discipline those who are persecuting others. 
Plead for provision of food for the hungry and, and for safe drinking water for the thirsty. Pray for, for medical provision for, for children and adults suffering and, and dying of preventable diseases. I mean, some of our missionaries, they, they are in homes and huts and, and villages, and they are there. They are the best medical care uh, within, within hours. Pray that God would use the skills that he's given them to share the gospel as they are mending the physical wounds that they're facing. Pray that the gospel would go forth. Pray for children and their parents in the foster care system. Pray. Pray for salvation and strength and, and, and protection and freedom and, and justice and, and hope and healing for, for victims. Pray for conviction and repentance and salvation for the oppressors. Paul was once an oppressor. Pray. For them, that God would change them and, and God would break down the criminal networks and that they would be dismantled and, and for oppressors to be arrested and, and prosecuted. Pray. There's so many things that we could pray, obviously, and that's the point. It's not to get overwhelmed, but it's to bow before your Father and to pray. I mean, the first thing that, that you do when you get up in the morning, you, you could pray. I mean, studies show that the first thing that most people get up in the morning is this. You know that thumb hurts of yours and mine. You ever get like, why do I have a callus there? Oh, that's the reason why, right? Like, may God help us to put these other things down. May God help us to put aside other distractions and that we would be a people that pray on behalf of the lost, that we'd be a people that pray on behalf of our brothers and sisters in need, that, that we would be a people that care, that we would show compassion and concern, that we wouldn't be so entangled with the things of this world, that we would see through the coming wrath of God, that we would see our God, that we would be humbled, and that we would fight for a people to come to know him. May God help us. It's only by his grace and mercy that that will be accomplished. If someone was listening in on your prayers this last week, what would they have heard? May God help us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that you are a sovereign Lord that you deserve all exaltation. Lord, you deserve all worship. You deserve our complete attention. And God, maybe as we've sat here this morning, as we just evaluate our own hearts, as we, we see the compassion and love for Amos and, and the way that he loved others, maybe we sit here and we feel empty. Maybe we sit here and we realize that there's just not any kind of sympathy or empathy for others around us. God, I pray that you would do a work in our heart. Maybe we sit here this morning, we've been so consumed with the, the things of this world. Maybe we've been so ingrained with uh, and entangled with uh, the things that we love. And maybe we realize, Lord, that we are far from really just loving you. God, I thank you for the intercession of your son Jesus on our behalf. We thank you that we can see the heart of Christ and how he is tender and loving and caring, that he is compassionate, Lord, that he slows down to care. God, help us. Help us to be like that. Help us to slow down. Help us to realize the most significant thing are the people that are in front of our faces, the people that we can care for and serve and sacrifice for, that we can give to. God, help us to be burdened for those that don't know you. Help us, Lord, to be convicted of how maybe we've strayed. Lord, help us to intercede on behalf of others that are in need. God, thank you for your faithfulness. And may we just simply repent. As we evaluate our lives, may we just repent, Lord. Confess our desperation. Confess our need. And God, we are thankful that you forgive. And Lord, that you see us through Jesus, that we are righteous. Lord, help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.